Good morning once again. This is the first Sunday uh, in uh, January. Actually, it's the second Sunday. I'm sorry. It's the second Sunday. I got my dates wrong a little bit. But it's the first full week of the new year. I know many are probably um, a little disappointed in some of the things that happened this past week, but uh, uh, we just have to remember that God has a plan. And uh, not like our lesson that we have started last week where God's people uh, disobeyed and God had to send prophets to send a warning. Uh, his word tells us what is going to happen. And we're starting to see signs of some of the things in uh, not only the United States, but around the world that uh, we don't know the timing of when God's plan will come about, but we do know the season. And I believe the season is ripe and that uh, we don't need to be discouraged because God is in control no matter what happens in our society, politics, or anything else. So as we begin our lesson today, let's start with a word of prayer, remembering those who are uh, hurting in a variety of ways, whether physically with the virus or other things or economics, and uh, maybe discouragement from last week, and just pray that God's Spirit will lift each other up and lead us to Him knowing that uh, he has our best interests at heart. And so let's have a word of prayer this morning as we start our lesson for this January the 10th. Father, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to come together to study your word again today uh, through the technology that you provided us. And for those who are at home, I pray, Father, your spirit will speak to them through this lesson. Lord, it's an eye-opening lesson, and it's uh, one that's hard to listen to as we see things that are going on in our world today. But these things didn't just happen today. They happened many, many years ago, as your word says. And I just pray, Father, that we will take that as understanding uh, for our nation as well, that if we turn our back and disobey you, that things will happen. Father, we know you have a plan. And I just pray, Father, we'll just look to you for guidance and direction and the encouragement we need to know that your day is coming soon. And I just pray, Father, that's encouraging to us because there's a lot it's going to happen, in, uh, especially in your kingdom, as you bring peace and uh, as we understand your millennial reign. We thank you for loving us. We pray that these words be used for your honor and glory. And we'll lift up the name of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, last week we started a new series. Uh, we didn't get into the lesson, but we had a big introduction. Uh, and as we talked about justice, and more specifically, justice and the prophets. And as I mentioned earlier and then in our prayer that God has sent prophets in the Old Testament time to his people who weren't obeying him, who were doing things that uh, he did not approve of. And so as you can see in your outline, I have a graph there of our series of study. Uh, God speaks through the prophets. We're going to have about a 14 uh, part study in various uh, minor prophets and then a couple in some of the other prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. Uh, throughout this study is God will uh, talk to his people about things that are fixing to happen if they don't turn back to him and follow his law. So justice and the prophets in our first section as we started last week was God requires justice. And our first lesson is a call to accountability. And we're, our study today is going to be in the book of Amos, as we mentioned last week. We talked about justice and what it means and we looked at several things that God told Amos that the northern kingdom, Israel, was doing that were in disobedience to him. We're going to have just a short summary of a couple of things that we talked about last week to get give you an idea in case you missed it. But you can go back and listen to it as Amos, the book of Amos, is God's roar, roar, R-O-A-R, for justice and mercy. The book of Amos is perhaps the most familiar of the minor prophets, not in detail, but in its theme of justice and in some of its striking metaphors. And we'll see one in particular, or actually a couple today, of the metaphors that Amos used during uh, his book. The figure of Amos, he was a Judean sheep breeder with a strong message for Israel, de for Israel delivered in the shadow of Jeroboam's pagan temple at Bethel. But it both attracts and commands our respect today as well in light of what's going on in our country. Amos prophesied during a period of national optimism in Israel. 
Business is booming. Boundaries are bulging. But below the surface, greed and injustice are festering. The immediate purpose of Amos's prophetic ministry was to call the leaders of ancient Israel to repent and to reform. Amos warned them that if they did not heed his call, their injustice against the poor and the weak would destroy their nation. God would not allow them to continue in their unrighteousness. Repentance or retribution would be their only alternative. The religious ideology of the Northern Kingdom of Israel sanctioned its unjust government and social order and thereby presented a distorted view of the Lord. In the verses immediately preceding the start of our lesson text, Amos clearly revealed the cause of his ministry. It, at seemingly every turn, Israel chose evil over good. So let's read the passages before our text today in Amos chapter 5, verses 7 through 15. Verse 7 starts, There are those who turn justice into bitterness and cast righteousness to the ground. He who made the Pilates in the Orient, who turned midnight into dawn and darkened days into night, would call, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them over the face of the land, the Lord is his name. With a blinding flash, he destroys the strongholds and bring the fortified cities to ruin. There are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detest the ones who tell the truth. You levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built strong mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. But I know how many are your offenses and how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Verse 13 is an interesting verse. Therefore, the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Verse 14, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts, and perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph, that being the descendants of the tribe of Joseph and of all the Israel nation. <clears throat> The prophet Amos accused him of mistreating the poor in verse 11. He then highlighted the people's numerous sins in verse 12 through 15. They punished those who sought justice. Kind of interesting how that is today. They accepted bribes and they discri discriminated against the poor in lawsuits. While these admonitions still ring in the air, Amos delivered the word of the Lord found in today's text. A call to accountability. And our text is in Amos 5, verses 18 through 24. I'm going to break it down into two sections, one being a dismal day in verses 18 through 20, and then a disappointed God in verses 21 through 24. But a dismal day in verses 18 through 20, I want to read all three of these verses from the outset, and then we'll look at each one individually. Verse 18 starts with a woe. And it says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Verse 20, Will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light? Pitch dark without a ray of brightness. If we start out in verse 18 with the woe, Amos' audience longs for the day of the Lord for twisted and selfish reasons. Though they did not prioritize faithfulness to their covenant with the Lord, they believe that the day of the Lord will be a day of blessing for them. They have forgotten that covenant blessings are contingent on covenant faithfulness. Let me say that again. Covenant blessings are contingent on covenant faithfulness faithfulness, and faithlessness will be met by judgment. You can find that in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, those two chapters. What prophets like Amos point out is that being the covenant people 
does not come without obligation. The day of the Lord is a common theme in the Old Testament prophets in Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Obadiah, and Zephaniah. The verse at hand implies that in Amos' time, the proper popular thinking surrounding the day of the Lord in Israel is gravely flawed. Why do you think that is? Israel believes that the Lord will arise on behalf of his people and defeat their enemies in a mighty display of his power on that day. Conveniently, God's people consider themselves exempt from judgment on that day because of their status as his chosen covenant people. Elevated status before God also elevates the degree of accountability to him. True, God's unique relationship with Israel provides them with special blessings and privileges, but it also comes with a solemn responsibility for faithful obedience to him, as it is with us in our age of grace that we live in today. The people in Amos's day have come to expect the privileges, but they have abandoned the responsibilities. Because of their false beliefs, the people will find themselves surprised that the day will be darkness for them, not light. Let's look at a modern day example and maybe we can get some understanding. Well-meaning lawmakers sometimes find their decrees end up doing more harm than good. This phenomenon is called the law of unintended consequences. When the U.S. Congress imposed a 10% luxury tax on yachts, some felt relief. The rich will finally pay their share of taxes or their fair share. Have you heard that before? But within eight months after the law took effect, the largest U.S. yacht manufacturer had laid off more than 80% of its employees and closed one of its two manufacturing plants. In the first year, one-third of the U.S. yacht building companies stopped production. Ultimately, 25,000 workers in that industry lost their jobs and 75,000 more jobs were lost in companies that supplied yacht parts and materials. Jobs shifted to companies in Europe and the Bahamas. The U.S. Treasury collected zero revenue, revenue from the sales driven overseas. Unintended consequences. Amos warned that those who spoke of a victorious day of the Lord would face unintended consequences too. Counting on religious rights to yield divine reward would result in God's wrath. Now, verse 19 is one of the metaphors that I mentioned earlier, but it has a true meaning in uh, the illustration and he shows in verse 19 when it says, it will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Amos illustrates the plight of people with two darkly humorous pictures. In both illustrations, a man believes himself to be safe right before he meets his doom. Many of us were familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where it says, No temptation will seize you, which is not common to man, and God will give you a way out. But how many of you know the verse uh, just before it, verse 12? Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Powerful verse. Many times when we think we're secure, there's things right around the corner that we don't see. Amos is saying that a bear is as deadly as a lion, and not even the man's house can keep him safe from a snake that has slithered inside. Two lessons can be drawn from these scenarios. First, like escaping a lion only to meet a bear. The lesson is it is impossible to hide from judgment on the day of the Lord. As the saying goes, you can run, but you cannot hide. In Amos's illustration, even one's own house, which may be considered a truly safe place, will provide no refuge from what the day of the Lord will bring. In your outline, and you have an illustration that many of you may have seen uh, through some of the social medias in the picture, and I'll just give a brief description of it, is a man on a cliff reaching down to save 
a woman. The woman can't see that there's a rock on the man, so she doesn't understand why he's not pulling her up. But the man can't see why the woman isn't helping because in a hole in the side of the wall of the cliff, there's a snake that's biting the woman on the arm. Not really the same illustration as what Amos used, but you kind of get the picture that we don't. there are things that we don't see and we don't understand. <clears throat> the Apostle John in the book of Revelations pictures individuals from all walks of life crying from the rocks to hide them from the Lamb on the great day of their wrath. But such cries are futile. Let's look at Revelations chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. Verse 15, Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Verse 17, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? Our first lesson was that <clears throat> uh, in this uh, verse uh, 19 was that <clears throat> it is impossible to hide from the judgment on the day of the Lord. Our second lesson is the day of the Lord and its accompanying uh, judgments arrive without warning. A person believes to be safe from harm when unanticipated danger strikes. Both Jesus and Paul uses the illustration of the thief in the night to describe the sudden and unexpected nature of the day when Jesus returns. Paul adds that people will be claiming peace and safety when inescapable, when inescapable sudden destruction comes. He, he writes that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. It says, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman. And the last part of it, and they will not escape. As the last verse in our first section of dismal day, the verse 20 repeats verse 18 when he says, will not the day of the Lord be darkness, not light, pitch dark without a ray of brightness. Amos reiterates his earlier point that the day of the Lord will be a time of darkness and not light. The Hebrew word translated pitch dark comes from the same root word that describes the total darkness that fell upon the land of Egypt for three days during the ninth of the 10 plagues. So as we close this section, let me ask you a question relating to things that may come before us. What common but wrong assumptions do Christians have about Christ's return? That's something to think about. Now, our second section, Disappointed God, verses 21 through 24, is pretty hard-hitting. And it's pretty uh, eye-opening as well. As God starts out in verse 21 with two words, I hate. And that's amazing. Uh, as it is just kind of a get your attention really quick. As God starts verse 21, he says, I hate. And then he goes on to say, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. In verse 22, even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Though Amos has been speaking for God up till now, the Lord himself steps in to express his extreme displeasure with Israel's religious festivals. These would include annual feasts like Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. Though the Lord had ordained these feasts for his people, he now refers to them as your religious festival. The Lord does not want to be associated with them in any way. He rejects mere observance of the days. The Lord hates how the people have twisted religion to their own ends instead of honoring the assemblies as he intended. Israel scorns anyone who tries to connect the people's wicked behavior and promote what is upright and good. See what Jeremiah says in chapter 44, verses 4 and 5, when he says again and again, I sent I, I sent my servants, the prophets, who said, do not do this 
detestable thing that I hate. But they did not listen or pay attention. They did not turn from their wickedness or stop burning incense to other gods. Wow. God had sent prophets time and time again to his people to turn back and obey him. Amos also challenged the people to hate what is evil and love what is good. Look at what Isaiah said in chapter 5, verse 20, when he says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And I think we can see these things coming to, to pass in our day today. But as Amos was, ta was talking about in verse 22, the three offerings noted here are required by the Lord as part of the Old Testament sacrificial system. The first one being the burnt offerings are foundational. They are completely consumed by the sacrificial fire. A burnt offering is to be offered every morning and every evening for all of Israel. The grain offering are offerings of flour and oil. The best part of the grain is to be given to the Lord through this offering. The offering celebrates that the Lord is the provider of what the land produces. And the last one being the fellowship offering are shared by the priest, the one who brought the sacrifice, and other people. The offering becomes a part of a communal or fellowship meal. And the word choice refers to the best of the herd or the flock that was used for the fellowship offering. It's interesting for God to re refuse to accept these offerings that he had commanded indicates that something is terribly amiss with the people who are bringing them. And God continues on in verse 23 when he says, Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. The Lord's strong disapproval always apply, uh, also applies to the music presented to the people at their worship assemblies. So let me ask you a question. What is the reason for such harsh words? directed against actions that the Lord has specifically commanded in his law, given through Moses. Well, the problem is that worship practices, such as the sacrifices and the music, have become an end in themselves. The people of God are merely going through the motions and words of worship, divorcing that worship with any real impact on their daily conduct. Here again, the words of Isaiah could be spoken by Amos to his audience when Isaiah in chapter 29, verse 13 says this, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Jesus will apply what Isaiah said to the Pharisees of his day in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9. When he says, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Two questions come to mind. Do these words apply to our day as well? They were spoken twice in scripture, once in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. And the second question is, I want to ask is, how do people get this way? If they truly started out following Christ, how do they get to this point? Well, maybe an example like the study that the government did, uh, approximately 10,000 gallons of water a year slowly enter U.S. homes as small trickles. A crack in a pipe rarely stays small. A burst water pipe can turn a minor drip into a house soaking flood. Plumbing leaks are more than a nuisance. Left unchecked, they can lead to tremendous cost for the landowners. For this reason, experts suggest that homeowners not let small leaks go unresolved. Or as a commercial used to say, a small spark can start a forest fire. The nation, the people of the nation of Israel have become complacent. They overlook seemingly small leaks and their nation's obedience to God. Catch that. They overlook seemingly small leaks in their nation's obedience to God. What seems to be minor cracks in their obedience would result in a flood of God's judgment. 
What spiritual leaks do we need to fix? Maybe individually, or as a church, or even as a country. Our last verse of today's study, Amos says in verse 24, but let justice roll like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. While the people have become quite content with shallow gestures of worship, the Lord expects and deserves much more. Amos specifically highlights the issues of justice and righteousness. Justice concerns the fair, lawful practices of a society that honors the Lord. Practicing justice requires a person to be actively concerned about not only what is just, but also choosing to do it. An individual who really cares about justice becomes passionate about making sure that it is carried out in his or her surroundings and in the lives of others. That the Northern Kingdom does not uphold justice is clear from the indication that Amos brings against the people. Such conduct makes their so-called act of worships nothing but a sham. No wonder the Northern Kingdom is ripe for divine judgment. That is why the day of the Lord that the people so fervently desire will be a time of darkness rather than light. Righteousness is closely tied to justice. To live righteously is to make certain that God's standard of what is right guides one's daily decision. When justice and righteousness are pursued habitually day by day, they flow like waters in a never failing stream. But how can this happen when people have clogged the flow through their stubborn and rebellious hearts and their contempt for God's righteous standards? The call to exercise justice and righteousness has echoed through the centuries to God's people of every era. The law set forth by Moses laid out what these qualities should look like in the promised land and they can carry over in our society today. Joshua affirmed these laws. Isaiah will be bold in decrying the empty worship of his audience. And Jeremiah will describe those who make the Lord's temple in Jerusalem a den of robbers, mouthing the words, the temple of the Lord, like a mantra that can save them while treating the people in need around them with the utmost scorn. God's desire for justice and righteousness is not a fad. His people do well to take him seriously. Christians could, could, should consider Jesus' call to be salt and light in Matthew 5 as a call to practice the kind of lifestyle that is encouraged by the prophets. Righteousness cannot be practiced in isolation from other people, though. It requires contact with the world, a world that is often characterized by injustice and unrighteousness. To be salt and light is to have a noticeable impact on our surroundings and that is what followers of Jesus has always been called to do. As we close our study today, our, our thought to remember is verse 24, when it says, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never ending stream. Well, next week, our study is gonna be in the book of Habakkuk. It only has three chapters. So I encourage you to read it before next Sunday because it takes a different approach than most of the other minor prophets. See if you can see what that approach is. It might be kind of shocking if you, as you read it. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to come to you today as a body of believers to study your word together and pray your Holy Spirit will um, help us to understand the things that went on back then could be going on again today as nations around the world have chosen to disobey you. And as your word says, your day is coming. And it's coming really soon. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to serve you. And pray, Father, these words will give you honor and glory. Be with those who've listened. And just pray that you'll encourage them to look to you for guidance. Forgive us of our sins. And we thank you for the gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.